reading from the book of Proverbs. Thus says the wisdom of God. The Lord possessed me, the beginning of his ways, the forerunner of his prodigies of long ago. From of old I was poured forth, at the first before the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains or springs of water, before the mountains were settled into place, before the hills I was brought forth, while as yet the earth and fields were not made, nor the first clods of the world. When the Lord established the heavens, I was there. When he marked out the vault over the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he fixed fast the foundations of the earth, when he set for the sea its limit, so that the waters should not transgress his command. Then was I beside him as his craftsman, and I was his delight day by day, playing before him all the while, playing on the surface of his earth. And I found delight in the human race, Verbum Domini. have made him little lower than the angels. With glory and honor you crowned him. You gave him power over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. of the air and fish of the sea that make their way through the waters. O Lord our God, how wonderful your name in all the reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in hope 
of the glory of God. Not only that, but we even boast of our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance proving character, and proving character hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because of the love of God, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has given, been given to us. Verbum Domini. Dominus Fobiscum. Et cum spiritum tuum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Gloria Ti, Jesus said to his disciples, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me, because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason I told you that he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Verbum Domini. <laughs> Several years ago, I was speaking with a pilgrim who had come here to visit, and he was saying that he was the unbelieving father in a Catholic family, and that he had argued for hours about God, about the church. He'd argued for hours with an Irish Catholic priest. But then he said, the day of his little daughter's first Holy Communion arrived and he attended. And after that mass, he immediately asked to be received into the church. He had no more questions. So something happened during that mass. He had no more questions. And of course, the Holy Mass 
is an encounter with the most blessed Trinity whom we celebrate today. The solemnity of the most holy Trinity, the central mystery of our faith. That so often we talk about what God has done So bringing everything into creation, as we heard in today's first reading, how he came to redeem us. God so loved the world, he sent his only son. The psalm today spoke of the son of man becoming a little less than the angels, but then now crowned with glory and honor, all things under his feet. And then we speak of his work of sanctification, today's gospel that you cannot bear it now, but the spirit he's going to teach you, he's going to lead you into all truth. So often we speak then of God's work, creation, redemption, sanctification. But today we consider God in himself, in his being, who he is, revealed to us as indeed one God, and even, as even our reason will lead us to that conclusion, there must be a God, and there must only be one God, there couldn't be competing gods. But then it's been revealed to us through the Son and through the Spirit that God is one God in substance, but in three divine persons. And so this is, a, some, this is an encounter at every Holy Mass. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I use the the prayer of St. Paul at the beginning, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. I use that this morning as well. At the conclusion of the Mass, you are blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And after the consecration, what will I pray today? As every priest throughout the world will pray. Through him. Through who? Jesus. Through him with him, together with him, and in him. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And so again, we look to the whole, to the blessed Trinity, through Christ now present in the sacred species on the altar, the bread and the wine now made his body and blood, through him and with him and in him. All glory and honor is yours in the unity of the Holy Spirit who makes these gifts, sanctifies these gifts, enables them then to become the body and blood of Christ. So this father, he had many questions, he had argued for hours, but then something happened and perhaps it was the prayers of his little daughter on her first Holy Communion Day. You're often told, aren't you? I believe I was by the sisters. Now, on your first Holy Communion Day, ask for something. Especially ask for something. Maybe she asked that Daddy Daddy will come into the church. Certainly, his family must have been praying for that intention. He received this gift of faith. So faith is a higher way of knowing that we can see farther. We can see beyond the limits of just our, our limited mind. And I think here that we're talking about God. If we could ever completely understand God, we would be greater than God. So he is the incomprehensible, immeasurable, infinite, beyond our limited nature. And even the seraphim, the highest of the seraphim in adoration cannot completely understand the incomprehensible one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we worship him, we adore him, we stand in awe before his mystery today, not just looking at the work that he has done. And the Catechism beautifully says this, the very first line in the Catechism, in article number one, the very first sentence says this, God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. 
So God in himself, perfect, blessed in himself. And this is an interesting point to consider too. That St. John in his first letter says, God is love. Well, if God is from all eternity, even before creation existed, before it was brought into existence, if God is love, who is he loving? For him to love, there must be an equal to love. So I'm going to be talking about how this truth of the revealed truth, we could not have come to know this without God revealing it to us as he did through his son Jesus and now through the Holy Spirit, that God has revealed this truth of his inner life to us. You know, the philosopher Immanuel Kant said the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity has no practical relevance at all. <laughs> that was what he said, has no practical relevance in our lives. Perhaps that's crossed your mind too. Well, what does this really have to do with my life? Well, today I want to help answer that question, what relevance it has. And to show that really the doctrine of the Holy Trinity makes sense of everything. It's only this doctrine of the Blessed Trinity that has been given to us to help us to understand what God has revealed to us that makes sense of everything. So I want to talk about three points in honor of the Trinity. Number one, how it makes sense of the sacred scriptures themselves, this doctrine of the blessed Trinity. Number two, how it makes sense of our own human experience. And number three, how this has been confirmed, this teaching, this doctrine has been confirmed by, by heaven itself later. So, first of all, let's look at the sacred scriptures, the data, if you will, of the sacred scriptures. What do the scriptures, God's words, teach us about God? Well, it teaches us that God is one, Jesus himself. We'll quote the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And yet he's also teaching us that there's a distinction of persons within this one God. Because he would say, the Father and I are one. Philip, he who has seen the Father, he who has seen me, has seen the Father. So we see this distinction of persons. Jesus will talk about anything that you ask in my name, I will give you. Another place, anything you ask in my name, the Father will give you. In one place, Jesus says, it is better for you that I go, because if I don't go, I will not send the paraclete. Another place, he says, if I go, the Father will send the paraclete to you. At the end of Matthew's gospel, go therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, not names, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is what the scriptures give to us. And we also see within the scriptures three persons as well. Three eyes, right? To be a person is to be an I. We begin our sentences, well, I did this, I'm a human person. And so in the scriptures we find where the Father says at the transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus will say, the Father and I are one. Yesterday the feast of St. Barnabas, the Acts of the Apostles, they are gathered, they're praying in Antioch. And the Holy Spirit says, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. So you have three persons. In fact, the Acts of the Apostles have been called the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. 
We see now this work of the Holy Spirit. Continuing, Jesus said, in today's gospel, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. Because everything that Jesus taught wasn't understood. And we have to give, be patient with ourselves, too. We may not completely understand, right, the Bible when we read through it the first time. Of course, we're not going to. But gradually, the Spirit's going to lead us into the truth of what Jesus taught, what he said. So you have these three eyes. Now, so think about now our own human experience. So this is the data of sacred scripture, what the scriptures teach us about God. The word of God teaches us about who he is. So now let's think about our own experience. You know, I have interviewed a number of groups on EWTN who are involved in wonderful, beautiful, charitable works. Groups like the Vincent St. De Paul Society, working, as he said, not to give a hand out, but a hand up, help people improve their lives. Or cross-Catholic outreach, doing so many wonderful works throughout the world to help the poor and the needy. And again and again, they will say, I received more than I gave. So yes, I've committed myself to this work. I've done a lot of it. I spent hours doing it. But I ended up receiving more than what I gave. And I call that the Trinitarian principle, that we do not give without it receiving back. Because that's the inner life of God, who is love from all eternity, the Father giving himself completely to the Son, the Son to the Father, and that love is so complete that it is another person, the Holy Spirit. And to think about our own human experience. So I've talked about the sacred scriptures, what the scriptures reveal about God's life. Now let's look at our own experience. Does this have any relevance to our lives? Do we see, as the catechism says, traces of the Trinitarian life? <laughs> traces of the Trinitarian life in his creation. What are some of these traces of the Trinity? Well, think about the fact that we cannot be complete. We feel like we are unfulfilled without giving ourselves to another and receiving from another. This is especially true in matrimony, but it's also true in friendship most of all in our own personal relationship with God, that we're not meant to be a solitude. God is not a solitude. And neither are we meant to be just a solitude. Even those who live the eremitical life as hermits, they're not just living a solitude within themselves. It's so that they might live this more intense relationship with he who is, that self-giving love to the other, the other. But in marriage and family life, we see also this trace of the Trinitarian life so that a young man wants to give himself to a young woman and she wants to give herself to this young man. And they want to be united. And even that marital union in the Bible is spoken of as knowing. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. So this, this knowing. But there is, even in this marital life, as I've talked with a number of couples who were having trouble having children, they felt like there's something missing in their marriage, in their life. And for those who weren't able to conceive, they may adopt a child. There has to be another one that they share their love with, this mutual love that they have. And then they feel like it's complete now, that they can mutually love each other, but then also there's another. And the fruit of their love is another I, another human person. So you see this, even within marriage and family life, this trace of the Trinity. And then let us think, too, 
about our own inner, inner life, our own interior life. St. Bonaventure has a wonderful work. It's not easy to plow it through, but maybe with a good commentary. The Journey of the Soul into God, his classic work. And he talks about the three ways that we arrive at this journey into God. First, we're looking outside of ourselves. We see traces of God and his creation. Then we look within ourselves, and we see there, too, traces of the Trinity within ourselves. And then we look up to God, who is being and power, goodness. But let's look, look at our own experience of our inner life. And Bonaventure says that we love ourselves, we love our souls, but we could not love our souls unless we knew our souls. And we can't know our souls unless we have a remembrance of who we are. Again, this reflection of the Trinity. And that we have these three faculties, memory, which is a reflection of God's eternity, intellect, by which we can know truth, and will, by which we choose what is good. And so memory. You know, yesterday was my uh, 29th anniversary of ordination, and, and um, of course, on your anniversary of your ordination, you go back to those days, you remember many of the details about that. I can go back there, and I can even experience in some way the joy of that that wonderful day, being ordained to the priesthood. But we also, with this faculty, so there's a certain element of eternity there, right? We can, it, it transcends time. And we can even somewhat look at what's gonna happen in the future. So I often say this to the pilgrims when they're, they're there at the shrine, and, uh, or here as well, but, uh, at the shrine, I'll say, now, I predict that after this talk is complete, you women will go to the gift shop. <laughs> and I say, because I've seen this happen before in the past, and I know that women like to shop. A lot of women like to shop. And uh, so there's a wonderful gift shop there. So even that, we can project you know, certain things. I, project, I predict that there will be vespers tonight at 5 p.m., God willing. Why? Because we have this schedule and this is what we've done in the past. So you see there's an element of eternity in this memory, something of the eternity of the Father. And then we have an intellect by which we want to know truth. And we're not satisfied until we get to the bottom of it, until we know what the truth is. And so this is a reflection of the second person of the Blessed Trinity on whom this Network is found in the eternal word. Not just the incarnate word as he was, but the eternal word, the second person of the blessed trinity. And then our will desires what is good or what we perceive as good, that we cannot want, not want to be happy and so we're going to go for that which we see as good that will lead us to happiness, even if we're wrong. It's only found in God. So here you see that within our very selves, we find this Trinitarian life. So finally, I just conclude with then third, the confirmation. So the scriptures, the doctrine of the Trinity to make sense of the scriptures, what we have. Secondly, our own experience in family, marriage life, married life, our own inner life, memory, intellect, and will. And then thirdly, heavenly confirmations. So the creed that we're going to pray today is the Nicene Creed. This was when all the bishops, over 300 bishops of the world in 325 AD, they hashed out, is Jesus God or not? Is he somewhat less than God, the greatest of all creatures perhaps, but created as the Arians held. And guided by the Holy Spirit, whom 
as again, in the Acts of the Apostles, we see the Holy Spirit at work. Guided by the Holy Spirit, they put together the Nicene Creed, which we continue to pray. He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So this is a heavenly confirmation. But the final one I would give you, propose, is the Fatima apparitions. Pope John Paul II went to Fatima three times. Pope Francis went there to canonize Francisco and Jacinta. And what were the children taught by the angel? Most holy trinity, I adore you. My God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. The prayers that they were taught, two of them refer to the blessed trinity. And Lucia, later, years later, she lived to be in her 90s. She said she contemplated, why the 13th? Why was it always on the 13th? She says, I'm not sure, but this is what the conclusion I came to. One, three. One God, three persons, 13. That perhaps this is why that date was chosen, that Our Lady would appear on the 13th of each month to confirm the truths of our faith. So indeed, this is a mystery beyond our complete comprehension, and yet we can know something about who God is. Why? Because he's revealed it to us. And every Mass like this unbelieving Father, we encounter the Blessed Trinity. May we grow in faith, hope, and love this day of the most blessed trinity, the central mystery of our faith. And I'd encourage you to read some of the articles in the catechism about the trinity, to deepen your own understanding of this truth about who God is. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.